The Red Squirrels Begin Housekeeping The first thing that Mr. Red Squirrel did after coming to the forest and meeting the Gray Squirrel was to look for something to eat. It was not a good season for a stranger who had no hidden store of nuts and seeds to draw upon. The apples and corn were not ripe, and last year's seeds and acorns were nearly gone. What few remained here and there had lost their sweet and wholesome taste. Poor Mr. Red Squirrel began to wish that he had eaten breakfast before he ran away. He even went to the edge of the forest and looked over toward the farmhouse, where his open cage hung in the sunshine. He knew that there were nuts and a fresh bit of fruit inside of it, and his mouth watered at the thought of them. But he was a sensible young fellow, and he knew that if he went back to eat, the cage door would be snapped shut, and he would never again be free to scamper in the beautiful trees. I will starve first, he said to himself, and he was so much in earnest that he spoke quite loudly. The words were hardly out of his mouth when a fat acorn came down at his feet. He caught it up with his forepaws before looking around. It was smooth and glossy, not at all as though it had passed a long winter on an oak branch. He took a good nibble at it, and then looked up to see if there were more on the tree above him. You can think how surprised he was to find himself sitting beneath a maple, for in all the years since the world began, no maple has ever borne acorns. There are no more to come, he said. I must take small bites and make it last as long as I can. And he turned it around and around, clutching it tightly with his long crooked claws, so that not the tiniest bit could be lost. At last it was all eaten, not a crumb was left, and then whoosh, down came a walnut. This hit him squarely on the back, but he was too hungry to mind, and he ate it all, just stopping long enough to say, If this maple bears such fruit as acorns and walnuts, I should like to live in a maple grove. Next came a hazelnut, then a butternut, and last of all, a fat kernel of yellow corn. He knew now that some friend was hidden in the branches above, so he tucked the corn in one of his cheek pockets and scampered up the maple trunk to find out who it was. He saw a whisking reddish-brown tail and knew that some other red squirrel was there. But whoever it was did not mean to be caught, and such a chase as he had. Just as he thought he had overtaken his unknown friend, he could see nothing more of her, and he was almost vexed to think how careless he must have been to miss her. He ran up and down the tree on which he last saw her, and found a little hollow in one of its large branches. He looked in, and there she was, the same dainty creature whom he had so often watched from his cage. He could see that she was breathless from running so fast, yet she pretended to be surprised at seeing him. Perhaps she now thought that she had been too bold in giving him food, and so wanted him to think that it had been somebody else. "'Good morning,' said he. "'Thank you very much for your kindness.' "'What do you mean?' said she. "'As though you didn't know,' he answered. "'I never heard of a maple tree that bore acorns, nuts, and corn, and that in the springtime.' "'Oh, well,' said she, tossing her pretty head. "'You have lived in a cage, and may not know what our forest trees can do.' That was a rather saucy thing to say but Mr. Red Squirrel knew her kind heart, and that she had said it only in mischief. "'How do you know I have lived in a cage?' he asked. "'I—I I thought you looked like the squirrel at the farmhouse,' she said. 
and then, forgetting herself, she added, You did look so surprised when that walnut hit you. Where were you then? he asked quickly. Oh, I was on a branch above you, she answered, seeing that he now knew all about it. You looked so hungry, and I had plenty of food stored away. You may have some whenever you wish. It must have been dreadful in that cage. Now Mr. Red Squirrel had loved his little friend ever since the first time he saw her on the rail fence, but he had never thought she would care for him a tired, discouraged fellow who had passed such a sorrowful life in prison. Yet, when he heard her pitying words and saw the light in her tender eyes, he wondered if he could win her for his wife. "'I shall never be able to do anything for you,' said he. "'You are young and beautiful and know the forest ways. I am a stranger and saddened by my hard life.' I wish I could help you. The Blue Jays! The Blue Jays! she cried, starting up. They have found my hidden acorns and are eating them. And sure enough, a pair of those handsome robbers were pulling acorn after acorn out of a tree hollow nearby and eating them as fast as they could. You should have seen Mr. Red Squirrel then. He leapt from branch to branch until he reached the blue jays. Then he stood by the hole where the acorns were stored and scolded them. Chickery, chickery, quilch, quilch, chickery, chickery, he said. And that in the squirrel language is a very severe scolding. He jumped about with his head down and his tail jerking while his eyes gleamed like coals of fire. The blue jays made a great fuss and called Jay, Jay at him and made fun of him for being a stranger. But they left at last, and Mr. Red Squirrel turned to his friend. What would I have done without your help, she said. I was so dreadfully frightened. Don't you see how my paws are shaking still? And she held out the prettiest little paws imaginable for him to see. Then... Mr. Red Squirrel's heart began to thump very fast and hard beneath the white fur of his chest, and he sighed softly. "'I wish I might always help you and protect you,' he said. "'But I suppose there are better fellows than I who want to do that,' and he sighed again. "'Yes, they may want to,' she said, looking away from him and acting though she saw another blue jay coming." You wouldn't be my little wife, would you? he asked, coming nearer to her. Why, I might, she answered, with a saucy flirt of her tail, and she scampered away as fast as she could. Do you think Mr. Red Squirrel stopped then to eat his fat kernel of yellow corn? Or do you think he waited to see whether the Blue Jays were around? No, indeed. He followed as fast as his legs could carry him from tree to tree, from branch to branch, and it was not until he had reached the top of a tall beech that he overtook his little sweetheart. They were still there when the gray squirrel happened along in the afternoon. Ah, said he, squinting at Mr. Red Squirrel, for his eyes were poor. You are getting acquainted, are you? pleasant society here. The squirrel's set is very select. You must meet some of our young people. Suppose you will begin housekeeping one of these days. I have done so already, sir, answered Mr. Red Squirrel, although his wife was nudging him with one paw and motioning him to keep quiet. Mrs. Red Squirrel and I will build our round home in the top fork of this tree, we shall be pleased to have you call when we are settled. Is that so? exclaimed the gray squirrel. I did not know that you were married. I thought you came alone to the forest. This is my wife, sir, said Mr. Red Squirrel. And the gray squirrel made his very best bow and looked at her as sharply as his poor eyes would let him. I think I must have seen you somewhere, he said. Your face is very familiar and he scratched his poor old puzzled head with one claw. Why, 
cousin Gray Squirrel, don't you know Bushytail? she cried. You lived in the tree next to mine all winter. To be sure, he exclaimed. But isn't your marriage rather sudden? No, she said, blushing under her fur. We have always liked each other, although we never spoke until this morning. I used to scamper along the rail fence to see Mr. Red Squirrel in his cage. Did you truly come for that? asked her husband, after their caller had gone. I truly did, she answered, but I never expected anybody to know it. You poor fellow, I felt so sorry for you. I would have given every nut I had to set you free. They were a very happy couple, and the next fall the gray squirrel watched them and their children gathering nuts for their winter stores. Mr. Red Squirrel, as the head of the family, planned the work, yet each did his share. The nuts were not yet ripe, and they gnawed off the stems, then came to the ground, filled their cheek pockets with the fallen nuts, and scampered off to hide them in many places. They were stored in tree hollows under the rustling leaves which strewed the ground, in the cracks of old logs, beneath brush heaps, and in holes in the ground. Don't stop to think how many you need, said the little mother to her children. Get every nut you can. It may be a very long winter. And if you don't eat them all, said their hard-working father with a twinkle in his eyes, you may want to drop a few down to some poor fellow who has none. That was your mother's way. When was it her way? What makes you smile when you say it? Mother, what does he mean? cried the young red squirrels all in a breath. I gave some nuts to a hungry squirrel once, she said, and he was so grateful that he drove the blue jays away when they tried to rob me. But she looked so happy as she spoke that the children knew there was more to the story. They dared not tease her to tell so they whispered among themselves and wondered what their father meant. As they gathered nuts near the gray squirrel, he motioned them to come close. Shh, said he, don't tell it from me, but I think the poor hungry fellow was your father, and it was a lucky thing for you that she had enough to give away. Do you suppose that was it? The young red squirrels whispered to each other. Do you really suppose so?' 